I'll bring everyone in. And uh, again, like I said, this is uh, the World Beat Cultural Center in Balboa Park. And we're unifying, you know, all of us together uh, with clean water, justice, equity for San Diego. And also we are in Tijuana. We have a, for years, we have a building in uh, Tijuana and it's called Casa del Tuno. And we've worked with um, different environmental justice groups there in Tijuana. Um, so on our agenda, we're gonna uh, first, um, you know, bring in, I think, so who has to leave early? Okay. So we're All from right. the Water Justice Exchange. Yeah, okay, the Water Justice Exchange. Okay, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Do you take dances classes, you know, here? I do. I, I used to, a while back, I took um, African dance um, at the World Beat, and now I currently do Bumba um, with Jade. Yes, next door to you. Well, we're going to be doing Bumba here for Earth Day. So, you know, uh, I love uh, Trinidad and Roti and everything. Uh, this is incredible. A uh, decima, that's how I, I'm pronouncing that. And that's right. Can you pronounce your last name so I don't mess it up? Too. I know that one looks more intimidating than it really is. It's Dalrymple. Dalrymple. Mm -hmm. Dalrymple. A nice West Indian name. And uh, you are doing a lot with education and equity and uh, your key mechanism, you know, for ensuring uh, to just growth and development uh, and service work and focusing on trans transforming engineering and education. Uh, can you tell us more about your work? You do it better than me, you know? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think I am a strong proponent of, um, I guess, justice. I think STEM, STEM equity is a, is a key piece in it. And given how fundamental STEM um, or STEAM, as I typically like to promote, um, is in terms of our growth and development, it is really fundamental for all of our communities to be well represented. And traditionally or historically, we don't have really great representation from communities of color um, and communities who may not be as resourced um, financially. And so it's really important. My work is really about how do we provide wholesome, um, culturally grounded opportunities um, that ensure full participation by those who are currently underrepresented in these disciplines. So do you lead a water exchange? You know, can you tell us something about that? Sure, so I, I lead it with my colleague, um, Marissa Forbes, and we have a third colleague who's not able to join us. And is it okay if I go ahead and just share some slides? Is that all right? Oh, yes, yes, please. Okay, so we want everybody to know about your great work what you're doing. May I ask the host to allow screen sharing is, if that's possible? Okay. Just a second. So are we ready? So you can share. Okay. Beautiful. Wonderful. Uh, let me just move this out so we have more. Yeah, so I, I represent today in particular the Water Justice Exchange, uh, which is an initiative really focused on advancing sustainable solutions to social and environmental injustice, specifically connected to water. Um, this initiative is led by um, myself, along with two amazing colleagues, um, Marissa Forbes, who is here, or Dr. Forbes, who's here on the call with me, um, and Dr. Drew Talley, who was unable to be here with us, but we're going to represent well on his behalf as well. Um, that I think that will come to no surprise to those tuning in and to my other co-presenters here 
that a lot of our water justice issues, in fact, when we look at them, they are truly um, indications of just overall injustice. And a lot of these injustices are both sort of that combination or at the intersection of environmental issues, but also primarily a lot of social issues. And we can look at things about even like sea rise levels or access to clean water, um, issues around the watershed and sanitation. Um, these issues, as we look more carefully at them, they are truly the intersection of both environmental and social inequities. Um, we have a lot of really talented people, particularly here in San Diego, who have been doing great work in these areas. And I guess the question that we wanted to propose is how can we facilitate even more collaboration so this work can be further amplified? And so with that, there are sort of three key tenants or three key pillars upon which the water justice exchange has been facilitated. Um, certainly, first and foremost is that advancing of water justice. Um, but secondly, it's really about the boundary spanning. So a lot of people are really doing great work, but often that work tends to be styled in our particular disciplinary focus or lens. And the, the, the goal here is really how can we facilitate this collaboration across these various boundaries? So how can we facilitate boundary spanning? And then the third pillar, which is very much connected to that second is the exchange and this notion that this work cannot facilitate unless we have multi-direction uh, flow of information and ideas. So with that, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Marissa Forbes, who will sort of speak to how we've operationalized these tenants specifically in our water justice exchange. Thanks, Odesma. So um, our primary mechanism for oper operationalizing this so far is what we call the ideation collaborative. And we held our first one um, last summer in August. And essentially, this is a, a two day opportunity to bring all kinds of um, people from different organizations, institutions in different roles to come together and see how we can work together. Um, and so this past summer, um, we included an immersive experience, which is kind of a fancy way of saying a, a purposeful field trip. And then it culminated in a proposal workshopping session. We had a little bit of seed funding uh, money and we all worked together to ideate new boundary spanning efforts that could advance water justice in our region through four primary mechanisms. So community projects or engagement, interdisciplinary research, policy development and advocacy training, or interdisciplinary coursework development. And we chose the location and the focus for, the, for last summer's um, collaborative to be the Kendall Frost Marsh. If you're not familiar with um, the Kendall Frost Marsh, it's located in the northeast corner of Mission Bay. And there are many complex issues at play in this area. And it's also um, close to uh, USD and many of the stakeholders who are wanting to come together and collaborate. And so this was our, our focused um, sort of uh, part of the immersive experience of the collaborative. So you can see here a couple of pictures from um, our immersive experience. And the goal was for all the, the people coming together to consider the Kendall Frost Marsh as a community aspect, asset and look at it from the perspective of all stakeholders. And so really that was kind of, that exercise was a, a microcosm of what we were trying to accomplish um, with the collaborative as a whole. Um, Odesma spoke about one of our primary values being um, boundary spanning. And so across organizations, institutions, et cetera. And so we ended up having about two dozen professionals join us in this ideation collaborative. And you can see on the left-hand side kind of some of the range of organizations that these people represented. And then on the right side, you can see um, the disciplines that we um, spanned. And this is the range of disciplines that were represented particularly from um, USD. 
additionally, we had um, researchers collaborating with students, collaborating with community members, and collaborating with faculty. And again, this was kind of the exchange between people from, from various places and representing various things and in different roles, which is part of what we're, we're trying to accomplish um, in coming together. So after our, um, our collaborative, we awarded seven boundary spanning proposals that were focused on the Kendall Frost Marsh efforts. And these projects are underway. And we're really looking forward to hearing about their progress at our next collaborative, which will be held this coming August. And that's kind of a segue into an, inv an open invitation where we hope um, you all will engage with us this year. You can see on this slide just a couple of our um, ongoing projects now. Some of them are more kind of oral history, um, storytelling, engaging youth in water justice issues, um, just to give a sampling of these multidisciplinary trans organizational um, activities that are now going on. And so with that, um, thank you for listening. And as I said, we really hope you will consider engaging with us this coming um, August in our next collaborative. And there's um, a link to a Google form where you can share your name and email address, and we'll be sure to send you all of the information about this coming upcoming ideation collaborative. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Forbes and, and my uh, Trinidad buddy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, and thank you for all the, the uh, good work that you're doing. Uh, the, so we want to get, you know, people of color and the BIPOC community uh, interested in, you know, some of these environmental justice issues and how, you know, how water is so important. And, you know, our coast, you, you guys, you guys are, uh, we, um, we, we want you to come on Earth Day and because we gonna, we're honoring your organizations. So that's why we're, you know, I'm here uh, talking to you. I'm giving you a surprise. <laughs> so we're basing our Earth Day in Balboa Park around your work. And so your organizations will all get a plaque uh, and uh, you'll be on stage, uh, you know, telling the youth and the people, you know, some of the things you're, you're doing. So, you know, thanks so much for your work, you know, for this planet, cultural workers, you know, it's, it's not easy. So, and, and most of you guys are in public health. We love it. Um, and also we are uh, working in noise pollution with Cornell University. And we had a, uh, we're ending our national science uh, award in noise, like I said, noise pollution. And uh, we've been with Cornell for about eight years. And so we're doing a lot of EDI work. And once again, you know, thanks so much. And we'll see you at Earth Day. And we want you to come and get your award. We are so grateful for this particular platform and um, to share this work and to continue to um, interact and engage with other amazing colleagues. And we thank you so much for that honor and recognition. Thank you yes, so thank much. you so much. Thank you. We'll see you Earth Day. And it's definitely for you. You know, so, man, I mean, I when I was in Mexico, uh, there's an organization called Wild Coast, you know, that's, that's working there. And um, we were, you know, working with them, you know, they've been all through Mexico. And then also um, we are, got introduced to Clean Border Water Now campaign. I, and I like all you cats because you, you're, you're in public health, you know, and that's, that is, you know, public health workers to me are always revolutionaries. You know, sometimes when they get out of their job, they forget, but you guys did not forget. You know, you're, you're doing, you know, the, the good work. 
and um, also the Surf Rider Foundation, we wanna, all, all you guys are getting an award that day. So that's why, you know, you're here. And um, with the World Beat Cultural Center, we have a radio, we're, part, we're pretty part of this on radio and, and we're honoring your words. And it's so important that the community honors the public servants. And that's what we are to the people. I don't mind being a public servant. And um, so I'm gonna get into the Surf A Rider Foundation, Clean Border Water Now campaign. And Trisha, and uh, Trisha is based in San Diego, California. Trisha serves as the Clean Border Water Now campaign manager. Trisha has a science and a public health background. She believes in environmental health, uh, that environmental health is related to public health. Advocating for clean water, clean soil, clean air, and the necessities of life. Trisha, how you doing? I'm Welcome. doing great. Thank you so much for um, allowing us to present today and um, how much attention you're giving to the clean water issue locally and regionally because it's, it's a big issue here. So thank you so much. I'm going to just jump on into my presentation today um, and of course introduce a little bit more about um, who I, I am. So let me see if, um... okay, we good? Fantastic. So just to start out, um, I moved to San Diego in high school from the Bay Area, and I went to Lincoln and Gompers in southeastern San Diego. Then I went on to um, City College and UCSD for my science degree, San Diego State University for my public health degree, and I just finished with my uh, JD from Golden Gate University School of Law in San Francisco. So I'm working on, a, on, on an advocacy campaign that has a lot of policy in it, a lot of public health and it's involving communities that I care about because the South of the eight has to deal with a lot of um, inequities when compared to the North of the eight. And that's something I'm very familiar with. Okay, a little bit about Surf Rider. So, so overall, Surf Riders Foundation is dedicated to the protection and the enjoyment of the world's ocean, waves and beaches for all people through a powerful network. So we, bear, we encourage grassroots activism the Clean Border Water Now's mission, which is a specific campaign within the Surf Rider Foundation, is to address and eliminate the sewage, trash, sediment, and chemical that plagues our ocean waves and beaches in the border region. We do this by raising awareness through outreach education um, while impacting policy through our advocacy work. A little bit of history about the transboundary pollution issue. So this is an old issue. It's been going on since the 1930s. Um, in 1944, the IBWC uh, was established, which is mostly responsible for um, a lot of the transboundary flows. And NAFTA was signed in the 1990s and we saw rapid population growth um, in Tijuana and, it, and the infrastructure has not been able to keep up with that population growth. In 2008, as Surf Rider, we started the No Border Sewage Campaign, No BS. Um, we later changed it to Clean Border Water Now after the February 27 sewage spill, where over 140 million gallons of raw sewage spewed onto the beaches of Imperial Beach, closing them for three weeks and not initially notifying the residents of what was going on. So then in 2018, Surf Riders stepped up their game and filed litigation um, against the IBWC for Clean Water Act violations. That's still ongoing. Um, 2019, 2020, we decided to partner with engineers, other community stakeholders on um, what we called the TRV solutions, which was basically a river diversion system on the US side that would address some of the transboundary pollution issues. In 2020, we had a, a, a big success when they signed the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement allocating $300 million to address transboundary pollution issues at the border 
And this uh, last year, they've chosen to move forward with alternative I-2, which we supported because it was the most comprehensive solution to addressing this pollution. We wanted the one that would give the most results, no matter what it costed. Um, and this was this is 625 million, which is a little more than uh, the 300 million allocated. Now going into just like, how does the pollution get to Imperial Beach? Um, it comes in, in three main routes, up laterally from San Antonio de los Buenos Creek. And I have an image there. It's about five miles south of the border and millions of gallons of raw sewage. Is, it goes in the Pacific Ocean every day. And I'll, I'll show you a video later on, um, one minute video on that. Then the Tijuana River um, also has pollution. That the sewage during dry weather from the city of Tijuana spews into the river and it flows across the border. When it rains, that water is diluted, but it still brings a massive amount of pollution. And then the cross banging uh, border canyon flows. So there's a lot of um, trash and, and sewage from um, communities that aren't hooked up to the sewage infrastructure um, that also makes its way across the border. And so there's a lot of untreated wastewater, trash and sediment that's included. So this is just a picture of the different canyons of the different entryways um, that, that have trash and wastewater. And this is the river, how it, when it enters into the Tijuana River Valley and it flows west until it reaches the Pacific Ocean. And this is a picture of some of the trash. This is on the US side in Goat Canyon. It's um, within a, a five, 10 minute walking distance from the campground down in the Tijuana River Valley estuary. And so um, certain, certain times a year, it's just full of trash and they have to clean it out yearly because it just accumulates. And here's a picture from the 2017 sewage spill. So this is the river mouth. So when it, when it enters the Pacific Ocean, that brown mucky water is pollution flowing into um, Imperial Beach. You can see north of that, this, the city. And here's this video. Um, actually, we collaborated with Wild Coast on this. It's just a short one minute video, but it, um, it highlights how much raw sewage is, is making it into the ocean every day. It's all raw sewage. You're kidding. Raw sewage. So you can imagine when that water travels north, it's diluted, but we're still getting things that we don't really want. Okay, environmental justice. So this is an environmental justice issue. Um, we should have access to clean water, air, and soil, regardless of our race, color, national origin, or income. And that's from the US EPA, right? So what if communities are being affected? You know, obviously we have our neighbors to the South of Mexico, which has a lot less resources. Um, they don't have adequate trash, sewage in a lot of communities. And then we have Imperial Beach and other communities like Chula Vista and San Isidro, which have large Latino populations. And when you look uh, at these maps here, um, where it distributes the race among San Diego County, that dark blue area and then center is like Southeast. And this, these are all communities south of the eight are mostly minority, but we have the most beach pollution in the whole county compared to our Northern counterparts. And so you could just see the disparities in access to beach and coastal recreations based on where you live. It shouldn't matter where you live. You should have access to the same quality of beaches, whether you're in North County or South County. 
Also too, this is the child opportunity index. So this looks at 29 neighborhood level indicators. You can see the dark colors here is very low opportunities for the communities along the border. So not only do they have to deal with pollution from in their water at the coast, but they also have the, all the cars coming across the border with air pollution, you know, low opportunities for, for children. And I feel like these areas are just having to deal with so much that in their environment should not be one of them. And so look at the beach closure day. So if you, uh, the, the top beach is the beach closest to the border, then Coronado, you're moving north. So you got 55 days this year, and this is a low estimate this year. Last year, we had 246 days of the beach closed, not accessible because of its quality of water. Um, it's as you go north, it gets better. And, and, and I, I don't even need to put the North County beaches on here because we know that the difference is so huge. So what's the solution? Right now, our best solution is the USMCA project, which um, has infrastructure mostly on the US side, but um, it's going to be on both sides of the border. It, it would address 100% of that solution five miles south of the border. Um, it would also reduce transboundary pollution, uh, days of impaired quality by 95% during the summertime. Um, when we see a lot of tourists at the beach and then during the winter months when there's rain by 76 percent this is that project that they have 300 million to allocate to but it's the price tag is 625 million so so there's a lot of um funding that needs to be accounted for but we're here at surfrider advocating for that funding you know the the extra 300 million dollars to get this project built so that that the community can have cleaner water one of the, the big policy objectives we've been supporting is the border water infrastructure program, which has been constantly underfunded. We're advocating for it to be funded at 100 million this year so that some of that money can go down to the Tijuana River Valley to work on the USMCA project and get that built. We also support the Border Water Quality Restoration Act. We meet with the elected officials at the state and federal level, local level as well, um, advocating for these policies. And then some of the things that we're doing in the community besides advocacy and, and outreach and, and presentations like this, we have monthly IB beach cleanups. So we were able to partner too with organizations on these. Um, it's a gateway to advocacy. We can educate the uh, individuals about the issues in the community, see if they wanna join our committee um, or you know, maybe sign a letter to try to get funding. Our last cleanup had 50 attendees and we collected 142 pounds of trash. And we've been wanting to expand this into parks or estuaries, making it more, um, um, making it more available to, to different communities. Uh, we also have our monthly Clean Border Water Now committee meetings where we focus on addressing the transboundary pollution issues every month. They're public, um, they're volunteer led, and we invite speakers every month from the community um, to talk about different uh, events. We're, this month, we're going to have Serge Jadina, the, the mayor, Mayor Vibe and the director of Wild Coast speak to our members about um, the TRB pollution issues. And one last thing I just wanted to mention is our Blue Water Task Force program, which is a community science water quality monitoring program. We test the water weekly throughout San Diego County. Um, we have four sites in the South County during COVID because they were ran by local high schools. They were kind of not operating. But now that the high schools are back, we got Mar Vista back online. So they are doing the testing again. Um, and we're looking to... Uh, to also activate those three additional sites and maybe even expand or, or see if we can assist other organizations in Baja California. Um, and then we, we also partner with our Blue Water Task Force on TRV water sampling studies. So our last one was in the 2021 um, and we published those on our website. So these often complement the county's water testing program and helping ensure accountability and reaching a wider audience. And that's uh, my presentation on the clean border water now. Thank you. Do we have any questions or, or are we gonna do questions at the end? We'll do questions at the end, but you are incredible. I heard that you're part of advocating clean water for 70, 
70 projects. Surf Rider is doing a lot. And I'm that that's the power of working for Surf Rider is they've built a big organization. So during um, Hill Day, last, uh, I think one or two weeks ago, all our chapters nationwide met with as many congressmen and senators as we could to advocate for clean water priorities. And in some of our uh, materials, it also included the Tijuana River Valley because if we want federal money, we need people that aren't in California to care about this issue. And so we're, I'm very fortunate that, that um, I'm local, but also working with such a big and powerful organization with, um, with a lot of members and pool and um, advocating for legislation. You're incredible. <laughs> I'm so proud of all of you. And we want to see you at Earth Day because we're turning Earth Day over to all of you. It's going to be, and you're also, you're getting awards. So you got to be there. Don't, don't, you know, I'm going to be looking around for Trisha and, and she's nowhere. You, you have to be there to come on that stage and receive that award for your foundation. And do you want to say anything else? You know, I know we're going to have questions and answers. But I know a lot of youth are, are, are looking at this right now. Anything else would you like to say? Is yeah, is that um, there's people fighting for the youth. Um, my, we just recently submitted a grant application with a local nonprofit paddle for peace. And our idea is we want to go in the inner cities, like high schools, like Lincoln and Gompers, where I went, San Ysidro, near the border, and get those kids out to the beach and teach them to surf. So um, we, we want to, you know, be out there and tell them that there's, there's opportunities in environmental conservation for people that look like us and that, you know, we definitely go out and get educated and we want to come back and share those resources as much as we can. So that background was a highlight of, of my career, I got to say, even, even though we haven't got it, just applying for it and saying that we're fighting for the youth to have access when, you know, they should have had access from the beginning is just like, you know, and, and I want them to, to be able to do the same thing when they grow up for, for the kids that that are in the same place they were when they were in high school. Thank you. You know, Trisha was really hard for us to go out to the beach. We would get stopped and harassed uh, and, and know that we're not supposed to be there. I'm so glad things are changing and you're one of, you're a part of that change. So all, you know, very proud of you. So, and also we want you guys to get together and we have a radio station and we want you to do a podcast because we have to let these youth know mm -hmm. and these dynamite people. And your other, there's somebody else and uh, Lucero, Lucero? Yes. Lucero. Lucero, you know. How you doing? Good. How are you? You know, I, I, I hear good things about you too. Uh, so you're with the Coast Keeper community? Yes, with San Diego Coast Keeper. And um, you do more of the advocacy and all that through the work. You know, tell us what you do for the Coast Keeper. You know, I, you're working with uh, the environmental system there too? Yes. Yeah. So um, San Diego Coast Keeper. Um, first off, my name is Lucero Sanchez. Nice to meet you all. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I work for San Diego Coast Keeper as their community policy coordinator. Um, San Diego Coast Keeper is a nonprofit 501c3 that works um, in San Diego County to protect and restore our swimmable, fishable, and drinkable waters. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the threats to water in San Diego specifically. Um, we give a lot of props to Surf Rider for working on those cross-border issues and we support them and all of that work. And we mostly specialize in the County of San Diego. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and continue that introduction. Okay, my screen should be accessible to you all. Let me know if it isn't. Um, but again, we'll be talking a little bit about serious threats to the water in San Diego. We talk about a lot of the issues around sewage and 
aging infrastructure and lack of funding. And that's an issue that San Diego as a whole faces outside of just border issues. Um, so we'll go into that. But here is a little bit more about San Diego Coastkeeper. Everything that our past panelists have really resonated with me and I know with all of the people in my organization, we truly believe in that strategic multifaceted approach. Without science, we can't inform the policy and without advocacy, we can't fund the science. Um, so it's really important that we're having all of those pieces and we use a combination of education, advocacy, hard science, restoration, and targeted outreach and engagement to chip away at each major quality and wa uh, water quality and water supply issues that we take on. Um, so that's just a little background on who Coastkeeper is, um, but we'll get into my part of the presentation here. Um, I wanted to start off with kind of a base for us all. I found the US Water Alliance's Pillars on Water Equity, and I thought that it was a really great way for us to go about water issues and better measure the success that or failures that the city of San Diego has and San Diego as a whole has. So these are some of the pillars here. Um, a community that is equitable should have access to safe, clean, affordable water and wastewater services share in economic, social, and environmental benefits of the water for everyone. And they should be resilient in the face of floods, drought, and other climate risks. So a little spoiler alert, San Diego is not very equitable in these things. And we'll talk a little bit more about why and some of the solutions that we can do moving forward. Um, a little background on what a watershed is. You'll hear me talk a little bit about watersheds. So I figured I'd add this slide in here, but a watershed just means it's an area of land that drains into a common water body. So for us, our common water body is the Pacific Ocean. We have 11 watersheds in the County of San Diego, six in the city of San Diego. And one of that water, those watersheds is the Tijuana River watershed. So we sometimes have these issues where our watersheds obviously don't match city or county lines or even um, international lines. So we do share a cross border with our watersheds. So it's an important part to think about when it comes to managing and making sure that each watershed is properly maintained. So the importance of watershed comes in terms of stormwater. It's the water that flows into our watersheds, meaning, you know, if you're not in the water, you're in a watershed. So we all deal with these issues. Um, but stormwater is just the water management name for water that falls in abundance over an urban area. So that's generally rain or snow, which we don't get very much snow here, so mostly rain. Um, but it is the leading contributor to pollution in San Diego's streams, rivers, and waterways. So when we talk about all of the pollution that we see in our ocean, um, in our beaches, stormwater is why. It's the mechanism in which it gets to move. Um, so that's just kind of the base of what we're going to go through and um, how that leads into the issues we see. So... Um, really a big part of this is urbanization. It means we are having more structures versus just having natural ground cover. So in a normal natural environment, a lot of the water, when it rains, it would soak up into our, um, into our soil and feed our groundwater system. But because we are adding concrete, we're adding streets, we're adding buildings, that means we're adding impervious surfaces, meaning surfaces that don't uh, allow fluid to pass through, which means we're having a lot more water just flow off of our streets, which can cause a lot of issues when we have a high level of that impervious surface. Um, and you can see that from the graphic on the left and a little bit more um, information on the right there. But what that means really is stormwater in urban areas can lead to the following. This really sums it up. Um, it can lead to erosion because we're having faster water. We're having a lot more of it. So it's going to 
be going faster. We have issues around flooding, um, we, which we've all experienced in San Diego. Um, pollution, because the water picks up all of the pollutants in our streets and in our creeks and any area around. It can also change and decrease our biodiversity and the makeup of our land. So it is a really important piece to talk about. Um, I want to be very clear, San Diego Coast Keeper is not against urbanization or against the cities, but it is part of the problem that we now face and making sure that it's something that is accounted for. So how do we generally account for stormwater? We have a system that is called an MS4. You know, one needs to remember that, but I did just add that in there in case anyone wants to look more into it. But our stormwater infrastructure is actually um, kind of unique in that it separates our wastewater system from our um, from our stormwater system. So those are two pipelines, one being what we flush down our toilet, what goes down our sink, all of that very clearly we know needs to be treated, needs to be managed because it would be a public health risk if we didn't. Um, but our stormwater system is a separate system that is really just meant to avoid flooding, to make sure that our streets are safe, and to make sure that we're not over flooding in our streets. So it just takes that water away. And that was a system that was in, it's been in place for a very long time now, but now we've really learned there really is no away that water ends up in our ocean. Um, and all of that water is untreated, which means that any pollution that goes down those storm drains, usually you see like the dolphins and it says, you know, I drain to the ocean, all of that does not get treated at all. So you can kind of start to see how that picture is forming in terms of why pollution gets to where it does. Um, but I also wanted to highlight an important piece here because it means that when these two systems are next to each other, it's really important for us to make sure they're managed correctly and that we're funding them correctly and adequately, because if they start to break down and start to mix, it means our wastewater, which should be treated for things like bacteria, is seeping into our stormwater system. So you can kind of see that this becomes a public health crisis when you have that um, wastewater in our oceans. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to bring that up in this slide here. Um, our stormwater system, this is for the city of San Diego. It is a giant system. It is composed of many diverse and interconnected components, and it is a $5.8 billion system if we had to replace it. And it is all starting to age. Um, the stormwater department manages a lot of this for the city, and it is a heavy lift, um, but it does come with its issues when things start to age and there isn't enough funding. Um, so that brings us to the four core threats, I believe there are to water quality, pollution, aging infrastructure, climate change, and lack of funding. And I'll go a little deeper in these, but this is just a, an introduction to all those things that I'm gonna go over in a minute here. Um, going on to our next slide. Stormwater that encounters pollutants becomes polluted urban runoff, which is San Diego's number one water quality threat. Um, so some of this is plastics, it's cigarette butts. That's the thing that we pick up the most at our beach cleanups and they degrade and add a lot of chemicals to our water. Um, car fluids, toxic metals, even pet waste. And I added these pictures here so that you can see what that looks like. This is generally in Choyas Creek, which is a very um, impacted community when it comes to watershed and water quality issues. Again, like Trisha mentioned, these are communities of concern, low income communities, communities of color, and they are the ones that are most hit by these kinds of issues. Um, I added these pictures here so we can see some examples, but I do, do wanna point out 
there are a lot of invisible pollutants, a lot of metals and a lot of chemicals that we can't see in our pictures, but that are there and pose a huge threat to um, us as well as any animals and wildlife and um, plants that live in the ocean. They can't just not go to the beach one day because it's closed. So it's really this huge environmental issue to think about. Um, so much so that we actually have safety guides for anyone who hasn't seen these. This is a guide to eating fish from San Diego Bay. Because of all the pollution in the water, it is advisable that you don't eat as many of the fish because of um, pollution issues. And this adds another layer of just an equity component because there are people that rely on subsistence fishing and it's part of their lifestyle. And, you know, you have to kind of make sure that you're following these guides to make sure that you're eating safely. Um, I think this is from the California Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assessment, if anyone wants to see this at a later time, if anyone does fish. On top of that, another rule that I hope most of you all know, and if you don't, I will share it with you all now, the 72 hour rule. This is a general guideline that discourages people from entering the ocean within 72 hours of there being a rainfall to avoid being sick from that runoff pollution. Um, so you see a lot of the signs around a lot of our beaches. I took a picture here in Mission Bay. Um, and most people disregard this and there are concerns of people getting sick and people having issues. Um, so it becomes more of a public health risk and an issue. And while I have this picture here, that's November, 2020, after the first rain of that year, I took a picture, every single beach in the County of San Diego was unsafe to swim in. Um, there are guides we have on our website as well as on county websites that will tell you this. I want to highlight that it doesn't only happen when there is rain. It happens during our dry time too. We are currently in a very historic drought and we are still seeing these issues. There are still beach advisories and beach closures because of all of the issues that we've talked about, like the wastewater system mixing into our stormwater system. So we are always polluting in the ocean and it's definitely an issue that needs to be fixed. Um, I wanted to highlight this. I know Trisha actually also had some um, numbers around beach closures. So we kind of overlapped there. Um, and while she didn't share those North County ones, I did here because I think that they are a huge um, mirror into what it looks like in terms of equity. For 2020, we went to the county website um, and the state water board's website where they have all of the dates for beach advisories and beach closures. Um, that means there were either a high level of bacteria, um, there was rainfall, there was sewage, there was other issues that made it so that um, they hit levels where there should have been an advisory or closure. So this is um, the map for that. And you can see here, as you start going south, the days increase by a lot, down to the last one that Trisha mentioned with um, the Tijuana issues, 306 days, it either had an advisory saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't swim in here, or it was downright closed. And that you compare with some of the beaches in North County, five days, 10 days, 22 days. You can see that that denser population where there's lower income communities, generally also um, lower income um, communities of color, Latino communities, black communities, they are all not getting the same benefit from the beautiful coast that we have. I like to point this out and because in 2020, we weren't allowed to go to very many places because of COVID. This was one of the places that people felt a little safer and it felt like a mental health day to go to the beach and enjoy that. And to have some of the beaches have that high level of closures and advisories is absolutely unacceptable. So moving forward, um, this is one of the reasons why aging infrastructure. I brought it up earlier, but 
our infrastructure in San Diego throughout the county, but more specifically in the city of San Diego is past its due date to be updated. There are a host of issues where we have sinkholes and flooding, which you all have heard about and you all know about. We see it in the news all the time. We see pipe bursts and this is all leading to potential safety concerns and property damage. We see the flooding lines on homes sometimes in the Choice Creek region. So it's a huge issue. Um, I'm gonna add some pictures here specifically of flooding. This should not be what San Diego looks like. It should not be what California looks like. California should be a leader in equity a leader in infrastructure and water quality and safety. And this is what it looks like when it rains. To highlight a little more, these are two pictures. They're a little small on here, but they are from the city of San Diego. Um, very clearly, they know that these issues exist. They just don't have enough funding to fix it. They don't have the capacity to do so. And part of that I will get into a little bit later, but here you see how many pipe failures there are. There's over a thousand, almost 2000. There is different degradation and flooding. And all of this translates to those water impacts to having bacteria and nutrients and trash. Um, this is what we face. It's throughout the entire city, but you can absolutely tell that it's concentrated in those areas of concern. On top of an already crumbling system, we have climate change. Climate change, again, poses a huge threat to the city of San Diego, to the county. Um, and just to our region in general. San Diego specifically imports over 80% of the water supply from the Colorado River and the Sierra Nevada range. So you can see here, both of those areas, ironically, have a higher drought than we do. We are all in a large period of a historic drought, and we're only going to get to see that become more frequent. We don't know that either of these sources is gonna be able to provide the water that we need. And it highlights the need for us to find more ways to be efficient with our water and to capture our own local water when it does rain, because we are gonna have heavy erratic rainy seasons as well, which are gonna only impact flooding even more. But this is a huge aspect of making sure that we're preparing for that climate change and for making sure that we are climate resilient. Another part of just fighting climate change and how water connects is California uses 19% of its electricity use for water transport and use, which is a huge percentage. If we were able to have a local water supply, that number would be reduced by a lot. Um, so the talked about some droughts, but like I said, we can also expect heavier rain seasons. When I think about climate change, I think about it just being more extreme weather that trends towards warmer weather. Um, but those erratic rainy seasons are gonna overwhelm that already crumbling infrastructure. It's gonna increase flooding, cause boil advisories when we have water quality issues and cause a number of other infrastructure failures. So. That's the end of my Debbie Downer and letting you all know on all the issues. Um, I'm gonna ha I have a couple more slides here on the solutions and the brighter outlook on all of this now that we can kind of breathe and know I'm not gonna um, bring any more issues up. Um, but really the answer to this is to invest in climate resiliency it's to invest in multi-benefit solutions that are going to address that water quality issue, public health, flooding. These are all such interconnected issues from what I was mentioning earlier. And it'll increase access to green spaces and green jobs and water supplies. And this sounds super great. And you're like, oh my goodness, what, what could that be? You know, like, why haven't we done this? Um, again, lack of funding, but what it is, it's green infrastructure. Green infrastructure as opposed to gray infrastructure. Gray infrastructure meaning the use of concrete and steel like dams, seawalls, concrete channels. That was the old way. That was not very climate resilient. It was very expensive and we're seeing the consequences of that now. 
if we were to use green infrastructure, it's an approach to water management that protects, restores, and mimics the natural water cycle. And we're just essentially copying what nature has already shown us because it is the best filter. Um, and it'll add to our green spaces as well, make our community a lot more beautiful and just have more of an increased quality of life for San Diegans across um, the county. So some more examples of what that looks like, what mimicking the natural hydrologic system looks like. It looks like rain barrels. It looks like um, native plants and having more pervious surfaces as opposed to those impervious surfaces. We, there is technology for us to have concrete that lets water flow in instead of just flow over. So these are all opportunities that the city of San Diego, the county of San Diego, everybody knows about and is excited about and wants to move forward with. And really the hindrance is we haven't changed our stormwater fee in a very long time, which means there is no funding for this to move forward. So let alone fixing the issues that we already have, like those pipe failures and sinkholes and um, flooding, we don't have the funds to become more climate resilient. And it's not a, if we need it, it's a, we need it. It's a when, it's something that really needs to move forward. Um, so just a little bit more specifically, some more examples of green infrastructure. Um, you know, we wanna minimize and disconnect those impervious surfaces. We want to have those rain barrels. Here's an example of someone who has a rain barrel in their home. And the city of San Diego has rebate programs for this and has um, resources to connect people with all of this. So it's not um, just you having to take that on. Um, but here are some of the benefits of green infrastructure more technically. It, slows our, fl our flow, which means there's going to be less of that erosion, um, less of those changes. It detains water, retains water. So it's again, keeping our water local, making sure that it's feeding into the systems that it falls into instead of just going into our ocean. Because really we treat stormwater as a liability. We treat it as an issue. And that is the reality of it right now, because it is this mechanism that brings pollution to our um, oceans. But we should really be thinking about water as one, as a resource. So we talk about a one water approach. We talk about making sure that any water that San Diego sees is managed efficiently and is managed very thoughtfully. Um, and a lot of people agree with that. There was actually a report that said that if we captured our stormwater from rain, we could provide 22% of our city's water supply. So we're currently importing 80% and we're moving towards our pure water program. If anyone um, is familiar with that, it's a wastewater recycling program that's gonna be online in the next uh, 10 ish years they're breaking ground right now and the expectation is that that will provide 50% of our water supply so really here we have the opportunity to flip that number and have 50% plus 22 potential percent um, instead of 80% imported we'd have 72 local water supply which is huge for our bank for um, just climate resiliency in general. We're never going to not be dependent on imported water, but we can be a lot more thoughtful about that because water is already incredibly expensive. And if we keep on the path, it's going to only increase exponentially and make it that much less affordable for people to have clean, safe water. Um, I'm going to add this slide here. That is our wastewater system. Um, I wish I had a little more time to explain this one, but basically we're recycling our wastewater. And the idea is that if we were able to capture our stormwater, we could link that into our wastewater system and make a whole system where we can connect everything, really treat water as one and really boost our local water supply. 
So again, um, really you've heard me say this the whole time, but stormwater infrastructure, the reason that there is not enough is because the city currently charges less than any other major Western city. It charges 95 cents a month, which we all know we, we would love for it to stay there, but a lot of other cities are charging up to $10, $13 a month. So comparing 95 cents of what, 95 cents to $13, we really understand why San Diego is behind in a lot of these management shortfalls. It's led to them having over 1.4, this slide is a little old, um, they're nearing $2 billion in their shortfall. Here are some slides from the city of San Diego that I took a screenshot of, but of the, the shortfalls and funding gaps that the city of San Diego has, that giant blue block is stormwater. It makes the other things look so small, like streetlights, roads, all things that we know as huge infrastructure issues that we also have to deal with they pale in comparison to stormwater and to the stormwater needs that we need, um, that the community needs. So right now, that's what Coast Keeper has been working on is pushing the city of San Diego to continue exploring funding mechanisms so that they can move that forward. They cannot increase that fee without a ballot measure. So that's what we're pushing. Um, and hopefully you'll hear more about that in this year, if not in two, but we're moving towards change. We're lucky to have city council members that care about this and community members who are participating and becoming engaged in this issue, but we need to push more. Um, we need to work on this a lot more. Um, some of the ways you can help, again, I mentioned those rain barrels, a great system just as like a smaller uh, scale thing that you can do at home. Even just having native plants instead of a lawn is a great way to just connect more with um, nature. There are things called gray water systems. Basically, we like to say laundry to landscape or showers to flowers. It's using the water that you're using your laundry to um, water your plants. Um, that's really what efficiency looks like on a smaller scale. And on a larger scale, a lot of what I talked about is we have to make sure that our representatives know what we want. Our representatives are there to represent us and we've elected them to do so. And we need to make sure that we are having our voices heard, providing those public comments, if not for them to make change, for us to have a reason to vote them out and have someone who will make change. So I encourage you all to get engaged, to even just sign up for our newsletters. We try really hard, Surfrider and uh, Coast Keeper both try really hard to make it as easy as possible to do those public comments. I know not everyone has the luxury of sitting through a meeting and listening to it all and checking up on all of the opportunities to public comment, but we write talking points for you all. We send you links and we say, you know, if you have five or 10 minutes, provide this written comment, or if you have more time, call in, but even just a written comment is really important to show that our communities care about this and we're listening and we're paying attention and we can't be ignored for any longer because it's something that communities really need. So I think that is it, the end of my slideshow. I really appreciate you all. Um, a lot for having this time for me to be able to share and for us to just connect on such an important day. I'm very grateful and I'm happy to answer any questions or um, talk at length about anything else. Ms. Sanchez, incredible. <laughs> what age did you know that you wanted to get into to learn about uh, you know, environmental policy? I mean, because you are dynamite, and you know, also, you know, also Trisha, and you know, everyone, you know. So, yeah. as, but you, you, you young, you know, you, you young youth, you're gonna be the ones out there to, and I, you know, of course, your elders, you know, guide the way. But tell me, you know, how did you uh, go to the University of California? 
San yeah. Diego. Thank you so much. Um, I actually, I grew up in Orange County. Um, I started volunteering at the Aquarium of the Pacific when I was about 15. I just wanted to participate in the ocean and learn about all of that, make other people learn about it as well, because I cared so much about it. And that was really the connection was we had jellyfish in one tank and uh, plastic bags in another, and they looked exactly the same. And it was right around the time that California had their plastic bag ban uh, a few years ago. So I was able to have that connection and conversations with people around like, hey, you should vote for this because we can't tell the difference between these. The sea turtles can't tell the difference between these. And it was really a beautiful connection. And I have found a lot of joy learning about the environment and learning about how to um, protect it. So I did transfer to UC San Diego and studied environmental science. I started campaigning for an environmental attorney who is now Congressman Mike Levin. Um, I'm very grateful for that experience. And then I joined Coast Keeper and I'm gonna turn 24 in 10 days <laughs> or 11 days. So I'm excited to, to kind of have, have that life ahead of me to continue to do the work and participate more. Happy birthday, you, 24? Yes. I'm scared of you guys, man. <laughs> I, I hope we did a little bit to pave the way for you guys, but you, it's it's incredible. Um, so anybody have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, I want to thank everyone, you know, all the other scientists uh, for being on the show. I think we're going to have Gabby uh, from uh, Water Tech Alliance. You know, Ms. Gabby is like, woo. She is all over the place. And so I, you know, I wanna thank you guys for being involved in um, water justice because I learned so much from you. You know, I've learned to, to really serve and, you know, and you guys need fundraisers. We're there to help you with fundraisers, concerts, you know, to make the youth aware. I mean, look what you, look what you guys all have done for this planet. You know, you're all gonna be there for Earth Day. It's your day, you know, and um, please bring a lot of material so we can just, you know, turn the, 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 the community onto your great works. Gabby, you wanna come in and say some things? Oh, thank hey, you. Hey, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's such a great idea. I mean, I know that Coast Keeper and Surfrider are always at Earth Day, but to have, I hope that they can have, you know, sort of split staff a little, because you're right there at the entrance and to start the conversation right before you even get into Balboa Park with Surfrider and Coast Keeper information right at the World Beach Center would be great and especially uh, representatives like Trisha and Lucero are awesome. Yeah, yes. I'm gonna have to have some roti there for my Trinidadian though. Yeah, I would. Give I'm, me what they are, is, give me water. <laughs> please, uh, that's, that's true. What, please. You, what you guys, what you guys knew, uh, you have a new tune is, uh, uh, Bring me water, let, let me mind my business. What, what, what? Drink water and mind my business. Mind my business. Drink water and mind my business. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're, you know, all of you have awards out there. Go ahead, uh, Gabby, because thank you for all that you do with Water Tech Alliance. You know, you know, giving us this information to you know, radio and, and, and event coordinator, the World Beach Center, you know, it's all yours. Oh, well, so you have you such, a, go ahead again. such a great platform. I mean, and you are in the city of San Diego's former water tanks, water towers. It's like the, you know, it was meant to be that you're gonna be water information central. Um, and so it will be great to kind of have more water information there 
at the World Beach Center on Earth Day. So it's, it's great to start. In fact, today I was up in Oceanside because um, Lu uh, Lucero mentioned the reuse, the potential reuse of stormwater put into a sewage piping and then getting treated and voila, you have more drinking water available right when you need it during a drought instead of letting pollution flush away. You have it treated as part of the sewage system. Um, so today was the ribbon cutting for the first potable reuse plant in San Diego at Oceanside. And it's so exciting. It was, it was awesome to go in there and the water tastes great. I don't, I wasn't expecting it to taste like anything except clean, but they, they know their water so well. So they put just the right amount of chemical or mineral minerals. I mean, like, you know, a little, whatever minerals make water taste great. This water was awesome. And to think it was once wastewater, and then to think that stormwater could become a part of this system um, during this drought is, is like the way to go. And Coast Keeper is leading the way. And Surf Rider is, as both of them have shown, uh, it's, it's not just the Southern San Diego community, but it's Mexico as well that's really impacted by the, by the sewage dumping right into the ocean. And the fact that you have a radio station that reaches both Tijuana and San Diego is going to be a great asset to a better water future. Well, thank you. Some uh, of the questions were already uh, answered, you know, some of our, uh, the youth that were watching you. Again, um, we're gonna, I think seven o'clock, yeah. That, is that right, seven? We're gonna rerun run this again. And uh, at seven o'clock, we recorded it. So uh, let's see, we have, how can families get involved with your organization? Are the internships or volunteer opportunities for the youth? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think families can first, you know, get involved with our beach cleanups, both Surf Rider and Coast Keeper partner in those and have our own individuals, individual cleanups. Um, but that's a great way to start getting involved and to really learn about it. I think I hadn't done a beach cleanup um, for a while, but every time you go, it reminds you of why you do the work. And being there for a couple of hours, you also start to see the connection between, this is a really important thing to do, but if we were able to make a public comment or an advocacy around this, we could potentially save ourselves from having to go and clean it up in our oceans. Um, so just going to the beach cleanups, Coast Keeper does have internships for um, college students. So I know that for youth, it's, um, a little less so, but currently we are piloting our very first year of our BIPOC science program. Um, it is a partnership with high school students who um, get a stipend, so no unpaid interns here. Um, but we teach them about um, water quality sampling and just um, training them on water and just like that field, as well as linking that with just outdoor activities. They went on a bike ride, I think last week. Um, they've gone rock climbing in between their water sampling. They do things like that. So we're excited about the possibility of having funding to continue that in the next years. Um, so look out for that as like a, an opportunity for high school students in the future. And collaboration, I mean, potentially grants would yeah absolutely would see a collaborative as even stronger than just a single organization you know the, the the percentage in the grant would be to the program of course but often those 
the support from other organizations. Yes, yeah, we currently actually partner with Outdoor Outreach, which is another or great organization that um, uh, their mission is to connect more people to the outdoors and make sure that there's that ac outdoor equity component. And through Surfrider, we have our um, Blue Water Task Force program that we're still revitalizing since COVID. So we have opportunities for local high schools if they're interested in um, setting up a lab. Uh, we might be able to, if you're interested, send me an email. We could talk about collaborating to teach the students how to do that. Also, um, you know, we're grassroots organizations. Our meetings are public. Come to our meetings and make a suggestion. Say like, what would you want to see Surfrider do with the community? Even if you want to lead it, you know, we're definitely looking at collaborating because like we don't have all the resources and, and there's, a, there's a big need. So we're definitely also big collaborators. Like I said, we just apply with that grant um, with this, with Paddle for Peace, which that's all they do is bring BIPOC um, community youth to the, the beaches. They also do adult lessons for BIPOC populations as well. Um, and so by, you know, supporting them too and um, seeing how we can collaborate, bring, bring your ideas to our meetings and, and we're definitely open to seeing how we can work together. Great. I just uh, wanted to oh, start this summer. I was just gonna add similarly to we invite, we would love for community engagement in our ideation collaborative. The, the goal of this is to have all those different perspectives and voices. And the benefit of that collaboration is, is that being there allows us to begin to form these boundary spanning groups who will bring that different perspective, different lenses in which we can look at these environmental water problems or these justice problems um, with, with a different perspective, a more holistic understanding. And, and the goal of the WJE, the Ideation Collaborative, is to provide that seed funding to then take an initiative and actually bring action to the problem. And so we definitely encourage the participation. And I just put the link again. Um, so anyone who is interested in that sounds like something they'd want to engage in please let us know and we'll ensure that you are kept up to date with when that event is taking place. And I also put our um, email address too, because similarly there, we tend to have opportunities in the summer for students who might be looking for research opportunities. Um, we're always eager to find, um, you know, just excited, curious students. Um, and, and certainly encourage them to reach out so that we can explore ways in which we can collaborate together. Yeah, USD gives some, uh, honors some amazing students who do water projects. I mean, there can be sensors that students develop to detect uh, pollution. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity still to solve these problems. And you three organiz you four organizations uh, with the World Bead Center would seem to be ideal collaborators with our Water Tech Alliance too. Thank you so much. And anything else you would like to uh, say to the public before we'll bless you on Earth Day? Anything else anybody else I know some of my uh, young people are looking right now. So, well, well this is yeah. a great World Water Day event with all of you. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Sanchez. Yeah, no, I just wanted to also um, echo everything and say thank you very much for creating this platform for us to have this conversation today and to share more. We're excited to continue to have partnerships and share resources. I did add in the chat um, our website, www.sdcoastkeeper.org. Um, it has a lot of the info that I talked about today, as well as resources and opportunities. Um, so that's probably your best bet if you're interested in participating more with San Diego Coastkeeper and um, with the work we do. Thank you. And keep doing the work you're doing. Of course, I know you never could stop. 
And uh, if you want fundraisers or whatever, we're here at the World Beat Center to really assist you. And you're brilliant, you know, so thank you. I mean, it's an honor for me to be with such brilliant sisters, you know, that really want to work for the environment and, um, and for the world. And we all need each other uh, in this Mbutu philosophy, you know, because we all cannot exist without each other. And none of us are free until all of us are free. Give thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mbutu. Well, Thank <laughs> you.